So I'm just going to ask Anita straight off, what was Britain like to work for as a musician? Terrifying. <laughs> Terrifying, but very, very, I mean, it was fantastic, really. I mean, we had 150% respect for that man, and it wouldn't impossible to be late for a rehearsal or to drop a pencil. There was a very, very tense atmosphere, but in a positive sort of way. I think, that, I don't think there's any, uh, I mean, I've done a lot of concerts in my life, anywhere where one, not everybody would try to do their very, very best, come what may. That was the most important thing here. Yeah, it was, it was very special to be involved with this festival, especially from the beginning and, uh, mm. Yeah, things have changed a bit here now. <laughs> <laughs> I what? don't think that Ben would like it terribly Ooh. to have all this. Oh, you have to, you know, have to amplify a little. He wanted to keep it just simple, yeah. <laughs> simple. Yeah. Is that the principal difference that you're aware of, is just the, the sheer size of the, of the festival as it's become now? Yeah, the size and mm. all the funny shops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't where, think where are you these would like it, but never mind. I mean, the things yeah. don't remain the same. But I mean, I haven't been here for. A, I actually kept away from here because I must. I think I had the most fantastic time of my life in Albury every year. Mm. It was fantastic, and when it all finished, I didn't really want to come back again and to see it change. But mm. you know, fate wanted it differently, and I'm <laughs> back. And uh, I'm a bit surprised, but it's very nice to be yes, here. Right. <laughs> You're very welcome here. <laughs> and um, as I've hinted at, uh, would you like to, to tell the story? Yeah, well, I mean, I probably have known Ben longer than anybody in this uh, hall because I met him without knowing it was him in 1945 when he and Menuhin came to give concerts in uh, liberated concentration camps. And I was, had been liberated in Belsen. And about three to four months after the liberation, there was a rumor going around that Yehudi Menuhin is coming to give a concert. Well, I knew who Yehudi Menuhin was, and I was, of course, looking for oh, the fantastic. And so this concert happened, and Yehudi Menuhin came in. I remember now what he was wearing, a green short-sleeved uh, shirt, and his underwear was coming out. He was obviously <laughs> dressing down, yes? <laughs> And uh, with a pianist, you see. And then this concert happened, and I write a letter to my cousin. Never believe it, something unbelievable. Yehudi Menuhin came here, gave a concert. It was really so annoying. We weren't exactly a concert audience. There was constant noise in the hall, and I was surprised they didn't even stop playing. And I have to admit, and I apologize, it sounds terribly uh, immodest, I wasn't that impressed with Menuhin. He seemed to sort of saving himself. But that pianist, I couldn't take my eyes off him. And I give a description of that pianist. I mean, I wrote the letter in German. I couldn't speak English in those days. I said, he looked as if he couldn't count up to three. <laughs> but what came out of the piano, I will never forget. I can hear it now. I was completely fascinated with this pianist. No idea who it was. Now, years go by, I've forgotten about the letter, the concert, and I find the letter as I was helping my cousin move house. And this was just before the maltings burned down here. And I had to go to Albury, and I said, I'll take that letter and show it to Ben. Now, it wasn't so easy to just go up to Ben and say, blah, 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 you know. I have to wait for the right moment. But the right moment came at the first uh, coffee break. And I said to Ben, if you want to hear a really completely unbiased criticism about your piano playing, <laughs> here's a letter. He spoke German, by the way. He was completely fascinated. And he said to me, you know, you wouldn't have known anywhere who I am because they misspelled my name. <laughs> the R and the I were very close together and it looked like Benjamin Batten. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Nobody really knew who I was. I mean, that was the beginning of Benjamin Britten's career. He'd just written the first opera. So uh, this letter has become quite famous, as is now in all the books, etc. There's somebody who, I mean, it's, it's amazing what must have emanated from Benjamin Britten if I, just liberated in Belsen, not really in another world, uh, it couldn't escape this uh, rather sort of mysterious aura that he had, and by God, he had it, mm -hmm. yeah. His piano mm -hmm. playing was completely out of this world, really. He didn't look as if he was playing the piano. He looked like an extension mm -hmm. of the piano, somehow. 
And you know, the beginning of the Mendelssohn violin concerto, I remember with castle sort of tremolo, I can almost hear it now. It was miraculous, it's, but no words for it. I mean, he was special. Hmm. That's why we are all here today. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for that story. Um, Nigel, just as we're talking about first encounters, would you like to tell us uh, how, when you first encountered Well, Benjamin yes, Benjamin? my first encounter with Ben was when um, I took over the title role in Peter Grimes at the opening night of the Edinburgh Festival of 1968, I think it was, and I had to take it over without any rehearsals, and I'd never sung it in English before. I'd only ever sung it in German, but I had been preparing the role in English. It was a Scottish opera production, and... Um, <coughs> Luckily, nobody told me till the end of the performance that Benjamin Britten had been in the audience, <laughs> or there was no way that I would have got through it, because I'd already sung um, Peter Grimes in German, Albert Herring in German, and I just regarded him as the greatest composer this country had ever produced. He was a massive hero figure to me. And the idea that he'd been in the audience while I was stumbling through Peter Grimes trying to remember what happened next without stage rehearsals was, would have been terrifying. He came up on stage at the end and he came straight up to me and it was my um, first taste of what I learned to regard as, as Britain speak. He said to me, Jolly well done, old thing. Jolly well done. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, happily he must have meant it because the next thing I heard from him was an invitation to come and create the role of, of Lechmere, you know, in Wingrave. <laughs> oh, tremendous. <laughs> yes, it must have made a spectacular impression in that case. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. I'm going to come on to your recollections of Owen Wingrave um, particularly shortly. Um, but I've just been hearing uh, from Anita, and, and we hear it a lot, about what a tremendous musician Britain was as a performer and just that he, to his fingertips, was, was musical. Is that your experience of him? Oh, oh yes, absolutely. I echo everything mm. that Anita said. Mm. Um, it was quite extraordinary, his piano playing. And I did experience it. Obviously, I heard him a lot in concerts. But I remember particularly, I remember once when he, we, we were talking about Beethoven, a, a composer about whom he had mixed feelings, as we know. <laughs> and he sat down at the piano and played the opening of the choral fantasia, you know, the, the piano opening, mm. from memory. And with a huge smile on his face. And it was just, just marvellous. And to be standing by him, I can remember the sound of that. And it did have this extraordinary... Hmm. Extraordinary, unbelievable sound. As if doing? the music was just <laughs> the music. The music sort of entered into him, and, yeah. and that was it. And that was that was yeah. how it was. It came out, and that was the, he was music in a way. Yes, he was <laughs> remarkable. Um, so I'd like to just just perhaps so we can talk about Owen Wingrave, particular recollections uh, of that particular performance. Perhaps Nigel first. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know, because we, we've, we've heard the music and David gave us this wonderful introduction and it's, it's considered as not the easiest of his operas to get to love or to get to know on, on first sight. I'm so curious about hearing it brand new, so fresh out of the, uh, off the score, what, what it was like to, to hear it and how did you get to know the music? Well, for me, uh, when I look back on the three weeks or month or whatever it was that we spent here in Albrook, all of us, doing first the music rehearsals and uh, then the camera rehearsals and then making the film. I have to say that I think that was probably the single happiest experience in my 45-year career. Uh, it, um, of course, for me as a young singer, and I'd sung almost entirely on the continent at that time, to be invited to come and, and participate in something like this under the great Benjamin Britten was in itself an amazing adventure. And I'd heard a lot of people said to me, oh, he's terribly touchy, you want to be terribly careful, don't get on the wrong side of him, etc., etc." And I can only say that from the moment we all gathered in the Wentworth Hotel. We, and all the colleagues, they were just the nicest bunch of people I've ever worked with. I was the new boy. And they were all so charming and just sort of, you know, 
took me up, made me feel fine, and we went in, uh, in a bus um, to the Red House for the first morning's piano rehearsals. And, of course, I was like a cat on hot bricks. Is he, is he going to regret having engaged me? Am I going to get it all right and all this sort of thing, you know? Well, he knew that I would be feeling like that. And with all his favourite singers tumbling out of this bus, he came straight up to me and he said, I just want you to know how thrilled we all were that you were able to take this on. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, um, that, was how, that was how he was when he was feeling comfortable. He'd got his favourite singers, plus me, and um, <laughs> on, uh, on his home territory. Mm. And it, it was just such a joy working with him. And I have so many <laughs> happy memories at, at one of the piano rehearsals, for instance, um, an aeroplane noise. These aeroplanes coming over. And he said, um, just wait, wait a minute, dear boy, please wait a minute. Picked up the telephone dialed the, <coughs> the number of the, the American Air Force base <laughs> and said, um, this is Benjamin Britain speaking and I want to speak to the colonel, please. And um, the, obviously a rather surprised <laughs> telephonist said, uh, yes, sir, just wait a moment. And the colonel came on and, and we heard Britain saying, colonel, you absolutely promised that those noisy things of yours would not come over my house in the morning. We have rehearsals for two weeks every morning in my house and you did promise. And um, the colonel, obviously, with his tail between his legs, said, I'm dreadfully sorry, Mr. Britain. And up in the sky, sudden total silence. And... <laughs> I thought, What's what a that? wonderful thing that this world-famous pacifist can just say one word and the mighty American Air Force goes home. <laughs> I'm slightly alarmed as to what happened to the plane. <laughs> no, I think they, they, they switched off and just sort of just freewheeled back. I think, you know. Remarkable, remarkable. Um, just what, what were your... Um, impressions of the of, of we've heard some of your impressions of, of Britain and Anita but of the music so you've obviously you were familiar for many years with all with his music yes, for the of chamber orchestra was side to Britain you know he was not in the holies of holies I mean he liked you he made you feel comfortable because he was feeling comfortable yes, yes. but the one thing was so difficult to actually take on board that mm. how very unsure of himself he was with mm. all this fantastic gift and how nervous he was before right. every concert I mean it was a big production Mm. You know, the atmosphere was electric, you know. That's why we were all, all on edge and tried to do our very best because it was completely unacceptable to, to not get up to that sun. I mean, that was so wonderful about it. But uh, he, was a, he was a difficult man, Britain. I mean, we mustn't forget mm. that. And he had his favourites, and if he doesn't, didn't like you, you could be out the next day. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's quite challenging to work under and to produce your best. Yeah. Um, your best, yeah. Did you find he wrote sympathetically for the, for, say, for your instrument, for the cello? Did you find it rewarding to play? Yeah, I don't think he wrote specifically for the cello. Mm. Is that what your question was? Well, no, just, just as a musician, whether you found it rewarding to play his music. Oh, very, music. very rewarding. Yeah. And fascinating to rehearse with him because when mm. we did his, like, the serenade, for instance, he would spend hours on the first few bars. He didn't quite understand... Why? But finally, you understood it. And then when you did the same piece with a completely different conductor, we sort of realised mm. that he actually didn't know what Britain meant. You know, he was so meticulous. It was all so important to him that the note was just, just long enough mm. or not. So you got involved in this pursuit of excellence, which was so exciting here, yeah, you see. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that, that precision um, yeah, and insistence was... on detail is, is, I'm sort of hearing that from, from across, is that something that you found working for him with the, we're talking about the horse's mouth, I mean, working Britain with his own music, but actually seeing his yeah. manuscripts, mm. the actual physical objects developing, is that mm. something you found? Mm. Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, yeah, he was, um, I mean, he, was, he, 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 understood, uh, he understood all instruments very, very well. I mean, he was a string player, of course, as well as a pianist, so he really understood strings, didn't he? He played the viola. But he really understood how to write for strings, didn't he? I mean, I think I've learned a great deal 
about write, string writing from actually studying Britain's string writing um, because it's a, it's a model, I think, of how, how to write. Um, I mean, he, he does write, he, he does difficult things, doesn't he? But they were never impossible. And um, I think, I don't think he ever wrote anything that was impossible. Did you find anything that was yeah. really not possible to play? <laughs> I, you know, it could, there were problems, but they could be solved quite oh, in a practical yeah. way, quite, quite, quite straightforwardly. Well, for the for the cello, of course, by this stage he'd been working with with, with uh, Rust. Yes. yes, it was very yeah. exciting. And he's, yeah. he, yes, they loved each other. That was a great, yes. <laughs> yes. great success. And yes. Of course, I remember we were uh, we were invited. Some of us from the orchestra were invited to the Red House to listen to the first rehearsal of his sonata, Britain sonata. Oh, really. So we all went, and they, there was their first playthrough. And then Britain said, well, now we, try to, we want to rehearse it, so if anybody wants to go home, <laughs> nobody moved, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was very exciting to yes. actually, you know, be a witness to that, the sort of birth of a sonata, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had, a, they had a good time together, Rostropovich and, <laughs> and Britain. They loved each other, I think. That was very successful. Yes, he seemed to bring something out in Britain yeah, that, yeah. that perhaps others didn't. I remember you, you telling me about a, a cellist party you had for... Oh, yeah, crazy for cellist Ros party. A crazy well, party. Well, you see, we used to take a house here. We used to be here for two weeks, and so the orchestra took a house, uh, colleagues together. It was fantastic, you know, like a, yeah, like a kibbutz, you know, we all <laughs> cooked together. Anyway, and... Uh, but occasionally we had to go back to London to do a concert and come back again. In, in my household... I had a lady, a doctor lady, who spoke Russian and was friendly with Rostropovich. And she loved to come to the Olber Festival just to listen to things. So she was one of my lodgers, you see. And uh, so I went back to London, came back to Olber, and she said, you know, I had dinner with Slava, and I told him about this household that we have here. And he'd love to come. <laughs> I said, well, why not? <laughs> so it was a bit difficult. How can we invite him without Britain knowing about it? <laughs> So I slipped Slava a sort of invitation during the rehearsal. I said, could you come for lunch? And blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so it was quite crazy. We had uh, invited all the cellists that were. There was only one viola player was tolerated because he happened to be a lodger in the house. <laughs> and so I went to collect Slava where he was staying somewhere along the main road, opened the door, and his wife was there as well. And we hadn't actually, and he didn't want to take her anyway. <laughs> so there's some very loud Russian words were exchanged and she disappeared. And Slava came to this party and it was really unbelievable. I've got wonderful photographs of that. He got completely and utterly drunk <laughs> on vodka. And previously, George Malcolm was telling me that I know you're having this party, we're having a concert tomorrow. Could you please make sure that he is not completely beside himself before we rehearse? I said, well, we'll try our best. Well, we didn't actually succeed very well because we had to go out all the time buying more drinks. We didn't. That man had the most unbelievable capacity. And then <laughs> I said in the end, Slava, I think, oh, he said, his English wasn't very good, actually, in those days. But he said, let George do a half an hour, do it yourself. I will follow. <laughs> Anyhow, in the end, we got a very drunken Slava to the rehearsal, and apparently he was completely impossible. <laughs> <laughs> However, at the concert, he was magnificent. But this party is completely, I mean, it just was too wonderful. Yeah. Well, we, well, had, we had language difficulties. He yeah. spoke better German than English. And his um, vocabulary wasn't necessarily the cleanest in the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it was quite difficult. I was a translator to find an equivalent. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, yes. that was quite an adventure. Wonderful. Well, yeah. I, I first met Rostropovich at the house I was staying in, Alborough. And uh, at that time, Elizabeth Wilson was also staying there, the, oh, yeah. uh, his pupil and the biographer of Shostakovich. And uh, so Rostropovich came over for a drink. And in my nervousness, I poured him a gin and tonic and I reversed the usual proportions, but I'm sure he was rather pleased about <laughs> that. <laughs> Gosh, well, this is these really sort of remarkable insights into these early festivals. I mean, yes. I'm not sure they were like that other, these days. If I've got time to tell you one other story about, By all means. about uh, Wilson. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a time, and there's another side of what can happen here, that not everything was rosy. 
uh, Rostropovich cancelled a concert, Haydn C major concerto, mm -hmm. for the first time it had been recovered, you know, in the meantime it's <laughs> worn out, and cancelled and suggested Elizabeth Wilson to mm -hmm. come and play. Well, that is not, that is a very difficult thing to do if you are Rostropovich, mm. Oldborough Festival, Benjamin Britten, and you send your favorite pupil. I mean, I've never felt so sorry for anybody like I did for Elizabeth Wilson. Can you imagine being in this mm. position? I'm deputizing for Rostropovich. I mean, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> that should never have happened. And yeah. uh, Ben was not at his best mm. in a situation <laughs> like that. Um, I've heard, speaking of, of perhaps Ben not, not being at his best, uh, the, the, how, how were the recording sessions of, of Owen Wingrave? We've heard sort of various reports of, of those. How did you find them? Well, like? it was very interesting because it so happened that I'd done a lot of television on the continent, and the rest of the cast, who were much more experienced singers than I were, uh, than I was, were um, not really used to television as a medium and did find the cameras very obstructive. Mm -hmm. And um, Ben also found it rather difficult that we had to keep stopping the whole time because um, we had uh, one director, the, so to speak, the stage director, Colin Graham, wonderful stage director and, and very <laughs> devoted member of Ben's circle, but we also had to have a television director who had a funny little gizmo which he would put in his eye like this and he'd say, uh, no, no, uh, Sylvia, you need to be an inch and a half uh, closer to Nigel <laughs> at that point or we're not going to get the shot we need. And one could see Ben sort of going like this, you know, wanting to get on with it. But he always maintained this, this wonderful courtesy and humour uh, to, to our singers. Now, I remember one occasion when uh, we, were <coughs> we were rehearsing on set and it was a scene where I was sitting opposite Heather Harper at, at a table. And, of course, we couldn't see Benjamin Britten at all while he was conducting. We could only see him on monitors which were scattered around the place. And you can't, if you're being filmed, suddenly go like this and take a cue from a monitor. <laughs> and Heather Harper, was, who was the most musical singer I ever worked with, I think, um, had difficulty with one particular cue. And um, so I piped up and said into a microphone, um, if I could possibly make a suggestion here, uh, because I'm off camera, when this difficult cue comes uh, for Heather, if Mr. Britton would be kind enough to give the cue straight to the camera, I can turn and take it from the monitor and give the cue to Heather, and um, there'll be no problems. Back came a voice over, the, over Ben's microphone. Uh, Mr. Britton thanks Mr. Douglas most sincerely <laughs> for his extremely kind and helpful suggestion. Mr. Britton is very happy to go along with Mr. Douglas's suggestion, but only on one condition that Mr. Douglas remembers that Mr. Britton's name is Ben. <laughs> <laughs> and, That's very nice. He was just lovely. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Um, I, I want to um, just also, uh, Nigel, refer to something you said to me just earlier, which was that um, Britton wrote specifically for voices or specifically for instruments, but also wrote for the personalities of the, of the singers yes, as well. Yes. Do you want to talk a little bit about how well, you experienced that? Well, that's something that I find so fascinating about, about his, his operas. I mean, the only two in which I sang in the, in the world premieres were, were um, the Owen Wingrave and then later I shared the role of Aschenbach with Peter Pierce in Death in Venice. But um, singing, um, for instance, um, Captain Veer in, in uh, Billy Budd, which I had the good fortune to do on many occasions, every single subsidiary character in that opera is genuinely characterized. Mm -hmm. And 
um, the, the other officers on board the ship, the seamen called Red Whiskers, the, the novice, and of course the, you know, the evil claggart, the, the baddie. Um, and uh, it, it, it was more than simply saying, oh, this is an amusing fellow, we write sprightly music for him, and this is an evil fellow, we write stuff for him, <laughs> you know. Um, the singers for whom he wrote, their personalities meant so much to him. And in Owen Wingrave, you can see it. Um, John Shirley Quirk had a marvellously avuncular nature. <laughs> he was actually a year or two younger than me, but he used to make me feel... 20, you know that he was 20 years older than me. I would always seek his advice. No, my dear boy, yes. <laughs> no, no, no. And the whole personality of, of Coyle, I mean, it was beautifully done by Jonathan Summers last night. I thought he was marvellous. But when one sees Quirky doing it in the film, it's written for Quirky's personality, Quirky's voice, Everything and the same with Heather Harper. Mm. There was something very, very <coughs> maternal and cosy and comfortable about Heather, mm. wasn't there? Mm. And, and that is Mrs. Coyle absolutely reflects mm. that. Mm. And um, he, that was one of the reasons I think why he so much liked having a group of singers, mm. to whom he loved as musicians and as people, because. He knew when he wrote the roles for those people, he knew exactly how to bring the best out of them as singers and as general performers, as people, as personalities. Mm -hmm. He was amazing like that, mm -hmm. amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, David, I, I was again just referring to something that you mentioned to me briefly yesterday, was that um, you weren't 100% sure about it. You've, you've got to like it more oh, yes, in recent yes. years. No, I'm well, just wondering I, I, what's I mean, I, I, I read out <laughs> what I thought then. I mean, it, you know, I, I, was, I was a young composer who was attempting to sort of not get too swamped by the Britain world, which was, which was a very, very powerful thing. You know, the, the, the whole court of Britain. I mean, I was a minor courtier. In the, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I didn't want to get too drawn in. But also I wanted to... Um, also, I genuinely thought that that the music he was writing at that time wasn't as good, oh, certainly when I started work in 1966. Uh, the pieces I was working on didn't impress me as much as, as some of the earlier stuff. So I was very pleased to find the music of Lerman um, Grove, as I said. Mm -hmm. But I didn't like the subject, and uh, I didn't... Uh, I've only... I've, I've come back to it. Mm -hmm. And I've realised, as I said in my talk, I realised now what Britain was getting at. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like we, play, we played that moment of great triumph. Mm -hmm. And so it is, it is not just, um, you know, an arbitrary tragedy where Owen just dies. I mean, he does die heroically. Mm -hmm. right. And that's, important. Yeah. that's very important yeah. Yeah. that he makes this heroic gesture. But he can't himself defeat the idea of war. So in a way, he should die, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the struggle goes on, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not solved and it probably never will be. But, I mean, to, to show something like that, to show someone who's standing up for it, even if he dies, is, is something very worthwhile. And that's what Britain was trying to get across. Right. Interesting. It was funny, if I could come in there, the, the, the actual, the last moment of the opera, as you know, David, was, um, was actually altered yes. as we filmed it, because it was felt that it was going to be terribly difficult to get across on the screen um, <coughs> the fact that that this boy was lying dead in this room where the old man and the boy had, you know, done all these terrible things centuries before. Um, because it was just going to be awfully dull to have a dead body lying there and all of us going, ooh. You know. <laughs> and so it was decided that it had to be strengthened in some way. And the decision that was taken was that Peter, as the old as the old general who'd been so terribly hard on, on Owen that he should realise the extent to which he had continued the grisly story of the Wingrave family. And he had to lean over the body and sing, My boy, 
And that was the end of the opera, mm. so that there was mm. actually something, something happened, not just a picture mm. of a dead body. It still somehow doesn't quite have the strength, because so many of Ben's operas um, end quietly, mm -hmm. like, for instance, Billy Budd. You've had this mm. terrific battle scene and everything. There was an enormous amount of noise during the course of the opera. It just ends with Captain Veer drifting away into his thoughts, yes, yes. and there is silence. Mm. And you always notice that the audience takes quite a long time to realize mm. it's actually finished now. Yes. And the, it, the, the Owen Wingrave didn't have that strength no. in the last five seconds. No, it, no. I mean, I can understand that he, I, I don't think he wanted to do anything which would yeah. damage the impact of the, the great moment when he enters the, the room, because that is, that is the climax, and that is his moment, Owen's moment. So that everything afterwards has to be really quite, quite um, subdued. Yes. And he couldn't bring the orchestra back at all. I mean, so, I mean, I can understand it is a slight problem. It's interesting, because we're going to talk about this in the next session, why, in fact, in the, in the current production, they missed out, my boy. Um, yeah. and, and I want to know, um, we will true. find out why yeah. they decided to do that. Well, that's a question know. on my list, I think. <laughs> well, one or two alterations were yeah. made. I must say, the original production, another yeah. one was uh, slightly amusing me. When uh, I, as Lechmere, um, uh, sing uh, to the others, I've, I've heard Kate um, badgering um, Owen mm. to go and spend the night in this, in this awful room. And I'm t telling the others about how I heard Kate doing this. And, and I had to sing, um, she said, you'll never stick it out. And when we did it at Covent Garden, suddenly there was laughter from, <laughs> whenever we got to that bit, from the orchestra. <laughs> and, we thought, Why orchestra. Is the orchestra? and then we suddenly thought, oh, Yes, one or two with slightly dirty minds, saying, <laughs> objecting to the phrase, you'll, he'll never stick it out. <laughs> and so I had to change those words to, he'll never see it through. <laughs> uh, and I was interested to see that last night he was sticking it out again. They obviously have purer minds in, in all breath. Nobody <laughs> laughed at the stage. Yes. Yes. Um, Anita, do, uh, did you, do you have views on the ending or how strong you find the work? Having no, seen it again no, recently? I was very impressed yesterday. But, you know, if you... Mm. My role was miniature, really, in this recording. Mm. You know, it's a completely different thing. If you sit in an orchestra and are just a minuscule bit of the thing that's happening, that I wasn't really aware. I've learned much more yesterday. Mm. We didn't have the time to really look at it. Uh, mm. So, no, I can't... Uh, I can't really give any views on that. I, mean, mm. I was very impressed with what was happening. But I've learned since yesterday many details that uh, escaped me, really. Yeah. yeah, interesting. I think um, I'd like to, to throw questions over to, to the, uh, the audience, if that's OK, if we have our, our lady of the microphone. Um, so do, we, do you have any questions? Would you put your hand up and just you can direct it, obviously, to any member of the panel? Yes, lady right here. Hello. That's on. OK. Um, well, so I've done a few projects here. Um, I did Peter Grimes last year, um, and the connection to the sea in that opera is so apparent. And I wonder, you guys spending time here and having fun with Rostropovich and hanging out, um, how important this location is to this festival and this life of making music, like how important did you guys find the ocean and the location to be just as much of a part of it as the musicians and the people. Does that make sense? Yes, to anyone who would wish I'm to answer that. Not sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, uh, Peter Grimes is immensely, immensely influenced by the location, um, dependent on the location, inspired by the location. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, there's a certain amount of uh, uh, the sea plays an important role, of course, in, in Billy Budd, but it doesn't actually affect the, um, the characterization of any of the cast in Billy Budd. They are professional sailors, but beyond that, you don't 
get much of a feeling of the sea in Billy Budd. I, would you say, David, Don't I you? can't think oh. of another opera which, in which, which is, is, is sort of impregnated with the, the sea or the, the, the seashore atmosphere, can you? Um, no, I mean, I, I, I think there is something about it. There is, there is a feeling for the sea, and I mean, with the sea shanties, for example, in, in the great sea, yes. particularly the great sea shanty in the middle of the first act. Um, but, I mean, the sea obviously was incredibly important as an inspiration to Britain, and I, I've, I've also found the sea, I've also found the sea a huge inspiration. I mean, we're English, and, um, and mm. I think the sea is our great symbol, and uh, we can't, uh, we, we're always aware of it. Um, I, to the extent that I now have a house by the sea in Deal, which is a sort of southern version of Albra, and where I ran a music festival, which I based actually on the Albra festival in its old days, or tried to, um, we're, 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 because I, 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 you were saying at the beginning you don't like the way really now, Anita, that it's, well, you're a bit unhappy about the way in which it's got so big. And I think there was something about the festival before the Maltings was built that was very, very special. Yeah. And it changed when the Maltings was built. Of course, Britain was responsible for that, so you've got to blame it on him. Yeah, um, <laughs> I mean, so, the but, Maltings, after all, didn't last didn't last in the beginning. I mean, it was built and then it was gone again. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the spirit, of course, changed a lot. I mean, to yes. actually do a concert here, we worked it out once, we're mostly in Blythesboro. Before we actually played the concert, we'd driven 60 miles. You know, it was 15 miles to Blythesboro for a rehearsal, mm. then back again, and then for the concert, and then back again. Yes. Yeah, but the discomfort of actually doing concerts here added to the excitement mm. somehow. Mm. <laughs> and I mean, when we actually did Edomineo in Blythesboro after the Maltings burned down, it's an event that uh, one will never forget because yeah. it was really like a wartime. Mm. The whole area was, I remember I, we were all summoned back here. The next, the first rehearsal will be in Thorpe Ness at the Workman Club and uh, the show must go on. How the show could go on transferred from the Maltings to Blythesboro anybody's guess, mm. but it did. Half the orchestra was sent home because there just was no physical room to play. Mm. But uh, the show went on, and I remember I was one of the lucky ones who stayed uh, behind. We were sitting so close, I think you could just about do that much <laughs> bowing. <laughs> but we did, and it was, and you know, Ben was a completely different person. Mm. And it was really like a war situation. I mean, there was such a spirit of camaraderie, which was fantastic. And we did it, and we gave, I think, I mean, I don't know whether the show was any good, but I believe it, <laughs> it, it was, was okay. It was fantastic, I remember it very, it very well. It was so good, I'm glad to you. Just sounds as if it's a tremendous But of course, energy. yes, as soon as the Maltings, then mm. we had another Maltings, everything was much more normal for mm. musicians. They got a room to be in, you know, and change your clothing, that doesn't exist here before. But that made it so attractive, actually. Mm -hmm. It was a, f a fight, and we all sort of fought together for something, for excellence, and mm -hmm. that was so special, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Does, thank you very much for your question. Yes, uh, Ivan. When you were talking about the opera yesterday, you said that we, the, the people who were going to see the film wouldn't believe how that had actually fitted into the malting. So can I ask you, those of you who were there, what were the logistics? Where was the band, for example? Where were you? Where was the set? Well, the, as I said just now, we never saw the orchestra. Uh, the orchestra was... Uh, the sets were laid out incredibly cleverly in that space. <coughs> And um, we never saw Ben, never saw the orchestra, only had these, these um, monitors. But there was just one occasion when I always saw Ben. <coughs> Coming off from that first scene, if you remember the scene in Coyle's study with um, um, Owen and Lechmere, and Lechmere says, I'm off to grind, and, and leaves the room. I had to walk down a sort of, sort of um, corridor thing. I'd become invisible by then. And at the end of the corridor, to my absolute surprise, that brought me to the back of where Ben was standing on a great big sort of chair with the orchestra in front of him. I'd never known where they were. And um, <laughs> as I came past, Ben made a very characteristic uh, gesture. His sign, well done, that went terribly. Went, 
like <laughs> <laughs> um, so but does, o- otherwise, but it, it, it's this question of what is the best way to televise opera is a very long and complicated one. I, mean, I won't give a long and complicated answer, but uh, I mean, I think I've done um, televised opera in every imaginable possible way. And to my mind, the only really satisfactory way of doing it is if you get a production which is running um, in the theater, all the singers know the production and uh, uh, it's, f- it's filmed <coughs> on stage with the television producer having previously changed quite a lot of the moves and positions from what you're using in the ordinary public performances. But you're all at, at home with the production. You're not busy thinking. Now, I, in this next, my next entrance, I come in after three. My right foot has to be behind a red piece of tape on the floor there so that camera seven can get me in side view as I start to sing this phrase. It's just a terrible lot for singers to have to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. And um, it's much easier for actors, of course, because they've not got the added element Mm -hmm. of the music and and having to come in on the right beat. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't really think that anybody has yet achieved the perfect way of televising on. So in the, in the case of Owen Wingrave, we, we saw a little bit on the, the, the documentary before the, the screening of the film, yes. that there were sort of, each singer had their own conductor, and it, to, yes. so you could kind of, get, that there was following Britain's direction. Well, so the, but the orchestra, as you said, I, I wouldn't have had any idea where you actually, well, you could have well, been well, in the sky. I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I can I mean, all I can remember was a, a house built within the house, you know, mm. that we were sitting somewhere, uh, you know, like we would have been down there, I think, somewhere. But we could see. I mean, why? Why do I, did I kind of remember that that painting? So we must have been able to see a bit of the stage. You must see. You, I, I don't. You, you may well have. We couldn't see anything of you. <laughs> lucky, lucky. <laughs> not, not, not as, as long as you could not hear something. Yes. But I mean, no, it really, was complicated. One it was of the heroes good. of of the the production was Stuart Bedford. Mm. who was acting as as Ben's assistant conductor. Mm. Because there were, as I was saying, many instances where you you simply couldn't, without spoiling a shot, turn your head, even the tiniest bit, to pick up a cue from a monitor. And we gradually worked out during the rehearsals that if Stuart, for instance, um, was lying on his back underneath a table, which wasn't... (laughs) Wasn't um, it, it, it wasn't visible to the to the camera, and you would suddenly see Stuart's arm come out from under the table and go boom, and in you came. <laughs> and there was one when I was doing a duet with with Janet Baker, that short duet that they have, when Stuart was actually um, he'd climbed up a ladder and was on a beam, <laughs> and uh, I sort of. Uh, you know, singing to Janet, and I had to make a make a little gesture. This is really too distressing. What can I do, do about it? What well, what I was doing was um, looking up to Stuart, <laughs> who was sort of hanging like a monkey, going boom. <laughs> me. He was without Stuart. I don't know we, we, if we could have done it. Do you <laughs> remember how long did it take to actually get it in the? It, not very long. I mean, the, the, the thing which is now. How many the, days? It must have been days and days. You won't misunderstand me if I tell one further little little story about Peter Piers. I must emphasise straight away that we all had the deepest respect for Peter. We <laughs> we loved him, and he was just marvellous. He was an inspiration to us all. When we laughed, we never laughed at Peter, we were laughing with Peter. Peter had great difficulty remembering his words. <laughs> and um, he himself, um, I remember uh, Ben after the first um, two or three days of, of rehearsals in the Maltings, he said, right, now let's all sit down um, and we'll just discuss how it's going. It seems to me to be going absolutely fine, though some of us need to go home and learn our words. <laughs> <laughs> to, 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 
Lord Peter, because there was this awful moment in the dinner party scene. The hardest thing for any singer to memorise is a list of words. Oh, yes. And Peter had to sing, talking about the battles of his, of the battling Wingraves years ago and everything, he had to sing, what was it, um, daggers, halberds, pistols <laughs> were their company, lances, sword thrusts, parted them from life. Well, we got dagbirds, <laughs> uh, thrustles, and you, we knew it was going to happen. He'd never got it right, not once. And he was in a terrible state. He thought at one point, uh, I've, I've had a brief, said, I've had a brilliant idea. I'm, I'm going to have a placement card at the dinner. Um, and it's going to look like a placement card. And I've got my words on it. So that's going to be all right now. And, of course, he'd forgotten that he'd just started wearing bifocals. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that didn't, didn't work either. Um, sitting beside me, uh, particularly when we did it at Covent Garden, where we had this huge table on the, on the, on the stage, and um, Sylvia Fisher was beside me. Uh, we all adored Sylvia. She was just lovely. She was the world's deepest pessimist. <laughs> um, but she was lovely. And she sat next to me at the table and in an evening dress. And, and um, as Peter's speech was about to start, a waiter came round, and this waiter... It, I'm not, not trying to laugh at the man. It was very unfortunate. He, he had the shakes. And the pudding being served was a blancmange. <laughs> and so here was the waiter with the blancmange going like this. <laughs> Sylvia's arms beside me were going like this. And her lovely Australian voice in my ear would say, Oh, dear, Nigel, here we go again. <laughs> and, 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 uh, as Peter would start, drag birds, thrustles. And, 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 but, but then, when, just once, when we were doing the final take for the film, just once, to the astonishment of all of us, Peter went straight through it without even a shadow of a mistake. <laughs> and the, the difficulty for all of us not to stand up and say, no! <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonderful. Thank you. That's wonderful. I, I, um, I understand from the documentary saw that the filming took place over, over nine days, and it does seem rather remarkable that it perhaps didn't take a little longer than that, but it, <laughs> that it, I'd gather that's that that was how days. long it is. I think so that's what the, the um, at least perhaps that's what the, the aspiration was. The actual filming ran over nine, nine days, days, I believe did it, did so. It, yeah. Yeah. According mm. to the film. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we do have time for some, for some more questions, if anyone. Yes, gentlemen, just here. How difficult, how, how difficult was it to adapt to the vast spaces of the Royal Opera House when you transferred? Well, funnily enough, I, we all felt... Um, and the public tended to confirm this, that the piece actually came over better uh, at Covent Garden than it did on television because um, <clears throat> you could get a much completer feeling of the house. And there's so much in the, in the opera about... Um, he'll listen to the music of the house, he'll listen to, you know, and, and the house plays such a vital role in the piece, doesn't it? It's all mm. the house oh, the yes, time. Yes. And it, on television, you can't get that wide angle impression of, of the house. And, and at Covent Garden on that big stage, it was felt that, that one could. And um, the... Uh, I... I think it was, uh, apart from the fact that one wasn't being one wasn't being inhibited by sort of having to have your left foot behind a red tape on the floor at a certain point and that kind of thing, which is essential for for televising, obviously, um, we all felt much more comfortable at at Covent Garden than we we had during the television mm -hmm. filming, and um, <clears throat> I remember Ben uh, <laughs> Ben Luxon 
uh, and I, for that first, um, that first scene in Coyle's study, we were sort of wheeled out of the wings on a little sort of trolley thing. Um, uh, 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 after the opening bars in the, uh, the orchestra, and <laughs> Ben, uh, Ben, lovely Cornish accent, used to, used to say to me, Next stop, Piccadilly Circus. <laughs> was, uh, this was a sort of ritual before we went on stage. You know. Thank you. But in general, I just like to repeat that was the happiest job uh, imaginable. Just the nicest bunch of people, and oh, it was wonderful. Thank you. Um, I saw a couple of hands over this side, which I've rather neglected. Is there a gentleman here? Yes, in the orange. I just wanted to ask you. <laughs> Thank you. It was interesting to hear you talking about the monitors, because having watched the film a couple of times, everybody seemed so at ease with it, except Jennifer Vivian, who on several, more than one occasion, you actually see her turn to look at the monitor. Was that noticed? Obviously it was. <laughs> well, I don't know, because, I mean, uh, uh, Jennifer... It could well have been because Jenny, again, Ben was so wonderful the way he wrote that very hysterical music for, for, for Julie, for Jenny Vivian's role. And it was musically complicated. It was her, her music was particularly complicated to underline the sort of hysterical state she was in. And oh my goodness, we're going to be driven out of this house and all because you won't join the army and you know the state she was in. She was terribly good at, 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 at um, uh, portraying that uh, terribly nervous, nervous state. And in the course of acting it so convincingly, she may very well occasionally have forgotten, do I come in after two or three, you know? <laughs> and, and perhaps that was why she <laughs> suddenly did that. But I'd never been aware of that, I must confess. And none of, none of us were aware of it, but then, of course, we weren't watching at that particular moment, you know. Um, the, um, yes, the vocal parts are, if I could just add in, they, they, they do seem strenuous and complicated, perhaps especially for, for mm. the women. I mean, is that, is that something you've noticed across mm. oh, yes, Britain's yes. operas? The vocal, vocal parts are very demanding. These operas are really yes, vocal, um, they? I mean, I suppose the, the language is, is, is perhaps a little bit more, is often a little bit more less tonal than, mm. than in the earlier operas. Mm. So the, the vocal lines do, do, I mean, the harmonies you're singing against are, are yes. often were quite hard to, mm. to pick up. He was, ben was so tolerant about that. I said to him at one point, Ben, I'm having difficulty with one lead where I come in. I remember it was on an F natural, and I had to pick it from more or less nowhere, and I don't mm. have perfect pitch, not by a million miles. And... Um, he said, oh, my dear old thing, you don't want to worry about that. You see, we chaps just write how far up and down we want you chaps to go to um, produce the effect that we're looking for. You are producing exactly the effect that I was looking for. And whether you're slap bang in the middle of an F natural at that point, I honestly don't know, but just mm. stop worrying. Good <laughs> <laughs> oh, <I'm> advice. <laughs> 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 if you, do, you, you then go and sing that role, perhaps in a German opera house, they say, Nein, Sie haben schon wieder auf ein E eingesetzt, anstatt einem F. And if one said, Herr, Herr Kapellmeister, the composer didn't mind, they, <laughs> they'd be unlikely to believe you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Ordnung time. muss sein. Hmm? Ordnung muss sein. <laughs> Ordnung muss sein. <laughs> uh, yes, just, just a couple more, and then, because then we can have tea. Gentlemen here. I think we, we mentioned this morning, you heard about Mahoney Piper. It was the same recipe for turning the screw and for a windgrave. Why does the panel think windgrave is languished until, in, in a way, until now, really? Hmm. Perhaps question for David, perhaps. Well, yes. Um, I mean, it, it was. I mean, I, I suppose it isn't quite as good as the turn of the screw. I mean, I, the turn of the screw is a, is, a, is, a, is one of Britain's, possibly Britain's finest opera. I mean, some people have said it is. I don't. I'm not. I wouldn't. Myself, it's not my favourite opera. But um, Wingrove, yes, was thought um, to be uh, slightly. 
I mean, it was a television opera, and it was somehow there was something about that. I know it got, onto, it got to Covent Garden, but then it was sort of dropped. Um, I, 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 it's difficult to know why, why people didn't perform it very much, but they didn't. I mean, it, it languished, and so it was forgotten about. And then when people mentioned it, they tended to think, well, yes, it was, it was okay, but um, not, not, not among the Great Britain works. And I suppose um, it's difficult now to know where to put it. I mean, I, my, my, my own um, view of it now is, is, is you know, I'm, I'm very impressed with it. And the more I hear it, I'm the more impressed I am. And I think it's a very important statement, obviously. For, but, but it is a very relentless statement about pacifism, I suppose, and, and perhaps not everybody wants to hear that. I mean, they, the, 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 the relentlessness of the women in Act One is, is, is hard, sometimes a bit hard to take. Um, uh, but there we are. I, 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 think, I think it certainly will now be recognised, I think, as part of the part of the Britain canon and not, 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 a, not a, a lame duck at all. It'd be interesting to, to hear perhaps about that for, for our second panel, yes. too, what, what yes. drew them to, to this production at this particular time. Just one more, and then, yes, gentlemen here. Have you watched the original production again? How does it make you feel seeing yourself in, in those days? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, having seen um, this morning various, various clips, I'll tell you one thing. Um, uh, when, when Lechmere takes the sword down from the wall, and uh, um, the character of Lechmere, um, I think the main purpose of the character of Lechmere is to show up the deep thoughtfulness of Owen, because Lechmere mm. is an absolutely typical gung-ho young man, mm. Mm. can't wait to get into the army, can't wait to get at the enemy, and um, there were masses of young men like that at that time. And um, the moment when he takes the sword down from the wall and, um, and he says, ah, oh, you beauty, you beauty, how many vile heads, vile foreign heads have you rolled into the dust? And then goes, chop, chop, chop. And uh, John Shirley quotes, let me uh, <laughs> pull yourself together, stop. <laughs> but um, I was disappointed yesterday that Lechmere didn't take the sword out of the scabbard, so he couldn't really do the chop, 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 <laughs> the way I like to see it done. But um, in, in general, I mean, obviously, you never hear yourself on a recording, you never see yourself on a film without occasionally thinking, oh, God, <laughs> you know, I ought to have got that, that bit better. But um, uh, I don't know, the whole thing, it, it, it's difficult to ask a singer that sort of question because the circumstances in which we made it was so very, very special. And as I said, it was such a happy, happy job. We were a happy family in the Wentworth Hotel, and I've made friendships for life as a result of that. And every now and then, one or other members of the, the, the cast would say to me, Nigel, you're going to have to help. Um, Sylvia's getting a bit gloomy. And Sylvia would be saying, no, I don't think I'm any good at this. No, it's all this sort of thing. And one had to say, now, Sylvia, you were even more brilliant than ever today, you know. Oh, did you really think so? <laughs> <laughs> she was such a lovely person, but you had to keep, had to keep um, inflating her in that, that sort of way, you know. <laughs> no, it was, it was just lovely. And so whenever I, I, I do occasionally see the film every two or three years and comes up or something, you know, and I think, my God, that was a happy time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>